Thank you, Alistair. So I'm, I'm Jane Hurst. I'm one of the uh, clinical genetics team here. Um, and myself and my colleague Richard are addressing two issues that were raised by members of SWAN. Um, the, the titles were suggested that we, that we address these issues. Um, uh, I realise there's a slightly mixed group in the audience, but I am predominantly addressing this talk to parents um, of, um, uh, of, of children and young adults. Um, who are members of SWAN. So why do some children remain undiagnosed? I thought it might be useful for you to know a little bit what uh, the role of the clinical geneticist. You see lots of doctors along your travels um, and uh, this, uh, this meeting today has got a genetic bias because we've been involved in, in, in organising it. Um, uh, but perhaps it would be just useful to see for you to realise how the geneticist fits in uh, within the other professionals, both within a paediatric hospital or the wider um, sort of medical role. We, there aren't very many of us around and we, we aren't the main carers for your child and we're there sort of giving in, in an advisory role. So um, uh, within the sort of uh, how you might meet us predominantly, um, the doctors anyway, are in a sort of clinical diagnostic role. We're helping to try and understand um, uh, the diagnosis and the cause of the, pro of the, of the problem. And we uh, have that role both here at Great Ormond Street and within um, the uh, hospitals surrounding here. And that's the sort of model that's used throughout the UK where there is a central um, genetics um, uh, sort of team based in usually the major hospital and then um, there are sites that, in, um, that are more local to where people live. Um, we help with the laboratory advise and introduce new genetic tests into, uh, that are used both by us and other specialists. Um, and in, in doing that, we support with the laboratory reporting and the, uh, and, uh, of these investigations. And that's going to be an increasingly um, big role, I think, for us in the future. Um, we work with the other specialists in the form of multidisciplinary clinics and meetings um, to try uh, and get uh, you know, a, a lot of advice in one visit. Um, we provide quite a lot of education um, to uh, other specialists about these individually very rare um, conditions that uh, they um, may be asking us for help about. We, offer our, we have a role as a genetic counsellors, but we, um, we in, in the ter terms of giving genetic advice, but we also have uh, within our team genetic counsellors who do um, more of the, uh, able to give more in the counselling and support than perhaps we give as doctors, where our role is more in the diagnostic role. And hopefully we liaise with your local services to try and optimise follow-up care. You've already heard a bit where we work. So we work here at Great Ormond Street. Uh, we work both in outpatients and we work on the, on the wards to see people um, as, and children as needed. Um, uh, along with paediatricians, along, uh, as well as paediatricians, we work with uh, uh, fetal medicine teams, we work with adult physicians, um, and each genetic service also has a large um, uh, genetic uh, cancer service as well. So going on to rare childhood disorders and the sorts of conditions that we'll be talking a little bit more about. Um, these rare childhood disorders are individually rare, but they're kind of common. And, and uh, you know, a lot of the children who are um, looked after in specialist paediatric hospitals um, have a, a condition which has got a pretty large genetic component. Um, and a lot of these um, conditions are lifelong, um, and some of them are life-limiting. Um, some have got specially... Uh, special specific centrally funded services and some of them don't and that does lead to um, particular when you haven't got a diagnosis perhaps falling in between um, the the very well uh, funded uh, services for specific conditions um, for uh, uh, whereas children without a diagnosis I think um, can lose out from that, um, the, from, the, from those uh, special funded services. And, and it's one of our ways to try and see if we can improve that by um, uh, perhaps, you know, looking for a specially funded undiagnosed clinic, um, as it were. Um, 
uh, which I think you know some of the families we do feel that that they're, they're not as well supported by you know both as in, in medics and and the educational service and you know that's one of the reasons why um, Swan came into being was to help and provide that support. Um, our assessment of children with these complex needs you some of you will have been through a, um, a genetics clinic so what we would do we would talk more about. Um, your family, we would talk more about um, the pregnancy and, and early milestones and we do a careful assessment of the features and that is what we call the phenotype and if you look at a lot of um, you know, uh, information that's put into research studies or if you read things you talk about the phenotype. The phenotype is the, is the features of the child um, and that will include how tall they are, how much they weigh, what the head circumference is and how it varies over, over um, a period of time as well as specific features. Um, our our um, baseline testing will include some genetic testing, and you're going to hear a bit more about that. Um, at routinely, we would start off with a, a microarray chromosome test, then we would target as needed. Um, we would do, take clinical photographs because to, to remember everyone at a point of time, because natural history is very important. Um, uh, and then there are newer tests which aren't uh, in use for everyone, and you're going to hear a little bit more about that. So I just thought I'd better run through about uh, you know, why babies are born with problems. Um, how do we approach this? How do we tease out the different causes? And, and try and tell you that perhaps, uh, although we're going to be talking a lot about genetic tests, um, a lot of the conditions that we see um, uh, don't have a genetic basis. Um, and I'll just illustrate some of those because however many genetic tests we do in that situation, we aren't going to get uh, um, a, a, a positive result or the results that we get may not be relevant for the, for the, for the um, condition that, uh, that your, your child has. So most children um, who are born with a, uh, a problem, and it's difficult to know if you, well, whether we use the term um, malformation is often used in the medical literature or anomaly is the other word that's sometimes used. So most children are born with one single problem. They might be born with a, if they're born with a problem, say a cliff, cleft lip and palate, a hair, hair lip. Um, uh, and that is rarely genetic in the way that it doesn't follow rules that were devised by Mendel, like dominant and recessive. It's usually what we call a multifactorial um, um, cause. So there are, there are a number of genes which are perhaps um, all adding up to in, in that child to sort of tip the balance into, into um, uh, the, the child um, having um, a, a, a cleft lip and that applies to other um, scenarios like um, spina bifida, um, same sort of thing, where it, things might be slightly more common within families but they're not a very high risk that indicates that there's one single gene there that's causing the problem. So. The, the risks of, this, of another child having that same combination of problems and perhaps some sort of environmental um, um, trigger uh, is, is pretty small. However, some children we can identify what the, the, where, the, where the problem is. And if a child has just got an isolated problem, that means they've just got a, a cleft lip and palate and they've got nothing else, we will call that an isolated problem. Whereas if they've got a cleft lip and palate and, it's ha and have other problems, they maybe um, they've got a heart murmur, um, uh, alteration to the structure of the kidneys and they're showing um, delay with development, we would think that, that was, uh, we would consider syndrome causes of that. And, that, and the syndrome causes included, include genetic and chromosome problems. Um, now, what's the difference between a genetic problem and a chromosome problem? Well. Um, We've stopped doing um, chromosome testing in the, in the way that it's being shown here, which is the carrier type. Um, the, the carrier type is a very good, um, however, it's quite useful when we're showing uh, in clinic, you know, to, to show what chromosomes are. So the, the genes are on the, cro on the chromosomes. You can see if you um, specially get the scales growing and dividing in the laboratory, you can see chromosomes that look like that, and then they can be... Um, you know, altered and made into that picture over there, and that's what's described as the carrier type. And you can see um, that uh, uh, generally we have two copies of our um, chromosomes, we have two copies of our genes, and those of you who 
um, can, can see at the bottom right, there's an extra copy of chromosome 21. So that's what you would see with Down syndrome. You see a trisomy of chromosome 21. You see three, three copies. So we often start in our search for trying to find the cause of a problem by looking at the chromosomes. As I say, previously we did this sort of testing in a, um, a carrier type, and now we use um, a, a test called a microarray, which is a more sensitive way of picking up um, what we call deletions and duplications. Too little or too much chromosome material, too much, too little DNA and genes in, the, in those areas. And um, essentially, um, if we're trying to find the clue to a, to a problem, a deletion of a, of a chromosome is more likely to guide us more quickly into it because it's, uh, we, we can look for genes that are, are missing there and that's more likely to, <coughs> to be associated with the problem. Now, if you've got a child who's got the problem as a, uh, due to a, a, a genetic problem, a problem with a gene, you can look at the chromosomes forever and ever and a microarray and a very sensitive thing, test of the chromosomes and you're not going to find an abnormality because the abnormality is in the... In the uh, in the spelling of the alt is an alteration to a gene and that sort of testing um, the chromosome testing is not going to pick up a genetic change now the commonest genetic changes are things like cystic fibrosis thalassemia um, uh, and then we get to um, other you know pretty common genetic conditions like um, forms of deafness uh, now for those uh, conditions we specifically at the present time ask for that test to be done so if we ask for a test for cystic fibrosis we're not going to get a result for another gene it is one it's one you you, you ask for one genetic test uh, and you get one genetic result that's where things are changing but that's generally speaking what's happening at the moment and you'll be hearing more about how we can uh, extend that so that's what we call um, targeted testing um, and if the problem is due to, uh, uh, what gives us a clue that the problem might be due to a change in a gene rather than the chromosomes? Well, we can look at the pattern of, and the way that the condition is inherited in the family. If it's tracking down the family from the mother or the father, it's likely um, to, to be a dominant condition. If it's just coming through the mother's side, it would be an X-linked condition. And if it's found in siblings but the parents are normal, then it might be a recessive condition. So these are the, these are the why it's important for us to take a family tree. We're then getting on to, I'm now going to sort of, so though those two, two categories there, we might find a definite reason why a child's been born with a problem. Now, I'm going to discuss a few conditions where we know what the condition is in the child, but a genetic test has difficulty in, 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 um, in, in picking it up. A genetic test, as in some of the new next generation sequencing testing that you'll, you'll hear about. That's because there isn't a change in the, in the, in the genetic code, but there is a, um, a, a, there's a change in the way the genes are switched on and off, basically. Um, and uh, those are sometimes called uh, in, um, epigenetic disorders, um, but the, it, the, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a difference in the switching on and off. And we can test for these if we know specifically what to test for, but there's a catch that you're not going to pick some of these up with that sort of testing. And again, here's another huge category of conditions that are not going to be picked up by genetic testing. So that's when the mother has got, um, uh, uh, say, uh, there's a, there's a, might have an illness like diabetes. Now, diabetes has got a slightly genetic component, but the problems that you see in the child are not due to the, the child having diabetes. The problems in the child are due to the fact that the blood sugar control in the mother is not very, um, you just, even with the best will in the world, often can't get it quite right and some um, people don't know look you know it's an unplanned pregnancy and they're not sure about the diabetic control so babies who are born um, to diabetic mothers have many times the rate of being born with a uh, heart problem or or a problem with the um, development of the spine so those are those can be uh, look like a chromosome syndrome but in fact it's due to uh, a um, uh, a problem during early development that isn't anything to do really with, with, with genes. Um, the four children on the right have what is said to be a really pretty um, common 
uh, condition, which where the mums had um, uh, had too much alcohol in pregnancy, so that's fetal alcohol syndrome, and the children on the right on the left have been exposed to um, uh, medicine used to treat mothers' epilepsy. So these can, you know, so so non-genetic problems can cause quite complex syndromic um, problems with with growth and development. Um, I thought. Uh, we're going to hear a bit about the DDD project, but um, uh, again, I just thought I'd just stress that before Helen Firth became um, um, interested in, uh, in how uh, genes might affect development, uh, when we were both much younger, um, we worked in Oxford together, she uh, noted that there were quite a lot of babies being born with this sort of malformation, and she did her MD thesis on um, uh, the sort of problems that can arise uh, in the limbs in babies who had um, been at, whose mothers had had a chromosome test in pregnancy, a CVS test. So this is um, this this test had uh, um, subtly altered the blood supply to the baby at a critical time in development, and had led to um, these sorts of limb defects, which actually can look very much like genetic conditions called ectrodactyly. So we, that's you know, again, you're not going to um, uh, pick this sort of thing up from, from, a, from a test result. Another thing, another sort of way that babies can um, be developing normally from, from all aspects, but their, their development or their growth can be restricted. So sometimes um, the fluid volume um, around the baby, the amniotic fluid can be very um, much reduced and that might be due to part of a, a condition like preeclampsia or pro problems with the placenta. And in those situations, the babies um, can be born with joint problems, um, which may be um, relatively uh, uh, mild problems with uh, the feet there, which is called talipes or club foot. And <coughs> because the baby's squ squashed up, but if it's actually um, occurring earlier in pregnancy, you can have much more significant problems involving the movement of a lot of, of joints and permanent um, problems. And those sorts of um, uh, joint problems, which we call arthrogryposis, are very difficult to pick up from genetically determined arthrogryposis. So, you know, when we're looking at test results, again, we have to bear in mind and be very careful that we've excluded other reasons why a child might have um, joint problems that aren't due to inheritance. So let's just kind of go through all of those again. And I thought, you know, um, just 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 kind of really uh, reiterating what I've said. So why why are our children remaining undiagnosed? So here we are. I just said there is a problem that genetic conditions can look similar or identical to to non-genetic conditions. Um, Here's a child, uh, and, th and this is where our role as a geneticist is, is sort of comes out into its own, really. So here's a, here's a child whose face development is subtly altered, um, uh, and the, the nose is smaller, and the distance between the nostrils is, 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 is reduced, and their brain scan doesn't show um, the normal separation into the two sides of the, of the, of the brain. And this is called holoprosencephaly. But the cause of holoprosencephaly it kind of runs through a lot of the things I've just talked to you about. You can have it as a result of a whole extra chromosome. You can have it as a result of a very small, um, a large or a small deletion of the chromosomes. You can have it as a result of a change in a single gene. Um, you can have it as a result of a metabolic condition, um, a changing to the, to, the, to the chemistry. You can have it in what we, is called a teratogenic, that's where there's been, exp and loosely speaking, diabetes would come into that, maternal diabetes. And it can just be, as far as we know at the moment, just an error of, of, of early development. Uh, there may be a genetic um, component there, but we, we don't know. So it's our job in the clinic to try and tease those up away and, and see that we can target things into the, into the right um, uh, category. The other problem is our test might not be sense enough, sensitive enough we might be, um, uh, to, to detect a problem. So I've told you a little bit about the difference in scale between a carrier type and testing for a single gene. So this is just a demonstration to, to, to show you 
um, that you know, if we're going down in the scale, we start with the carrier type and then we're going down to whole genome sequence and you'll hear more about that. So that the, it's a huge difference in sensitivity and at the, at the present time we don't have one test that covers all of that, that spectrum from a, a, a um, mutation in the DNA at the top there to the, to the um, uh, alteration to the chromosomes as a whole chromosome. Um, and this is really just saying, showing the same thing. So the scale of genetic alteration is, is different um, at the present time is, is detected by different sorts of analyses that um, we, we target. I mean, in the future, this might not be so, but at the moment, um, uh, you know, you, you can, you can um, get an appreciation that uh, we have to do different tests to find uh, well, different mechanisms of genetic tests. So that's another problem. Our test might not be sensitive enough. And I think probably quite a number of members of, of SWAN were diagnosed after the introduction of the microarray chromosome test, which then detected small chromosome alterations that had not previously been detected by the carrier type. So that was the, 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 the um, bringing in a different sort of analysis, which was more sensitive, could pick up a problem that was there. Problem three, I've just told, I to, it goes back to what I said about there isn't, there may be um, no alteration to the DNA sequence, and it's one of these switching off and switching on type of problems. So these are children who, um, uh, it's the same groups of genes on chromosome 11, and in different ways they're switched on and off. Um, you can have the normal balance where you end up on the 50th centile like me, or else you can have... Uh, you, you can have certain ones switched on and make you big and certain ones are diff different and you're small and that's Beckwith syndrome and Russell Silver. So it's balance between the two. Um, problem four is, well, problem four is huge. Um, problem four is the condition is rare. It's not known. We can't test for it. And we don't know. I mean, you know, it's, it's all those unknown unknowns. So that's why we need... Uh, other ways that we can look to see that we haven't missed a uh, or don't need to consider a, uh, a genetic cause for the problem. And so you'll hear today about three um, uh, projects which are helping us um, to cover all of those unknown um, genetic conditions. So the DDD project, Caroline kindly gave me some slides here. I think most of you in the audience will know um, where we are working as a genetics community to, col to collect um, samples from uh, children who, in whom there isn't a diagnosis known at the moment. And, and the, uh, it, it's, it's the scale of getting so many children together which will, will improve the power of analysis. You're going to um, see... Um, uh, groups of children of, um, with the same sorts of phenotypes evolving from this testing process. Um, so you can see the objections there, uh, obviously, to um, find out the cause and then to put that into clinical practice. Um, and I was told you it's a UK-wide UK collaboration with a plan to recruit 12,000 um, children. And I'm sure Caroline will talk to you more about that individually if you wish to know. Um, so far, they've reported over um, 300 diagnoses, and you'll see that some are coming up more frequently than others. Um, uh, so they are conditions that previously we found maybe found difficult to test for or recently been um, identified, which is this one on the far left, which has got a big hit there, ARID 1B. It was a condition that only relatively recently the genetic cause has been identified, and we haven't had a, had a test. So a lot of those are in the... Um, uh, in, in the project, and there are quite a lot of genes that cause different various forms of, of seizures and epilepsy, where the um, spectrum of problems has been so large, you couldn't, uh, there's been so many conditions to consider that you ha targeting hadn't been an effective approach, and it would be the same sorts of thing for some of the um, uh, conditions that causes um, uh, changes into the way of the structure of the brain, uh, to, the, to the structure of the brain. So, that is going to be um, uh, good, but even at the end of the day, uh, there's still going to be some children who don't have a diagnosis. Um, and I hopefully I'm telling you some reasons um, why they might not have a diagnosis, even after DDD have considered 
all of the what they're, what they're doing is considering genes that are known to cause conditions and then you've got um, alterations in, in genes that you don't know whether they are um, significant and that's where seeing a whole group of children perhaps with the same genetic change and the same features is going to give that um, extra in, uh, information and, and it's finding new genes. The second talk is why and why is it going to take so long to answer? So I'm going to hand over to Richard. He's going to t ask you that. But I just thought, um, you know, my inbox actually was today as of yesterday when I was doing this. Um, I'd seen a couple of brothers in November 1992 and the, the report of the causative gene was going off to the journal Brain yesterday. OK, so that is what um, that sort of. Uh, what happens? Why is it taking so long? Well, there's only two families known in the in the in the world to have the same condition. Of course, there are going to be far more of them, but there are just two very big um, um, families, and it turns out that they've got dominant alterations in the gene that's, that's that causes um, a problem that we recognise in, in a recessive way. So it's been a it's been a, a long tangle to get it out, and it's those sorts of things that we didn't know when we were starting that are, are proving proving um, uh, uh, difficult. Well, not difficult, it's a challenge, but it, it is, it's, 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 um, uh, it, it's frustrating for you as families that it seems to be taking so long. And um, I, I guess if we were starting now, we would expect that it wouldn't be quite, take quite so long. <laughs>